Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is desert buffalo, bison herds on the Colorado Plateau. And it will be presented by wildlife biologist, Aaron Bott. Aaron, thanks again for being here today and bringing us another one of your specialties. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me today, everyone. Uh, I think that this is an interesting subject that doesn't get a lot of public attention. And uh, the story, I think, is fascinating. So I'm excited to share with you some information about one of the best kept secrets in North American wildlife conservation. And that is bison living on the Colorado Plateau. So without further ado, we'll get right into it. Um, by way of introduction, um, thanks Sunny for introducing me, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say that I'm a wildlife biologist. I work for government agencies and uh, NGOs managing and protecting and conserving wildlife throughout the American West where I've spent my entire life and my family's been here for some time now. Um, I specialize in large carnivores, uh, specifically wolves, but I have had the incredible opportunity uh, in the past uh, to work with bison in the Colorado Plateau. For four years, I was a, a biologist down there on the Colorado Plateau, managing and monitor monitoring uh, our bison herds. And uh, that's a picture of me on the right hand side with a cow bison, just a, a yearling that we had darted and radio collared in order to better monitor the population's overall health and reproduction. So today I'm going to be talking with you about, uh, like I said, bison, but bison not in Yellowstone, but bison rather out in the desert, something that people generally don't think about when we're talking about these Great Plains mammals. So let's orient ourselves to begin with. If you have traveled with Natural Habitat Adventures to the Southwest on their canyons trip, then you should be familiar with the Colorado Plateau. But if you have not been to the American Southwest, know that the Colorado Plateau is a unique uh, topographical feature in the American Southwest. Um, this enormous elevated uh, sedimentary montane uh, desert is situated in the Four Corners region of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. And to give you a little bit of a geology lesson, um, Hundreds of millions of years ago during the Jurassic and um, Cretaceous period, this part of North America was in a very different location on the globe. Um, this part was actually just about 12 degrees north of the equator, and we had the equatorial trade winds blowing through this region, which caused an enormous erg or a, an ocean of sand to swell up and cover this entire region. And over the next tens of millions of years, as the continents continued to drift, this area was inundated by oceans, which later cemented all of that sand, and then was finally elevated during several orogenies or mountain building events when the Pacific tectonic plate and the North American continental tectonic plates began to grind into one another, um, causing the rise in the Rocky Mountain chain just to the east of the Colorado Plateau, and also giving rise to this, this very large landscape feature of sedimentary rock, uh, mostly sandstone, but also limestone and shale and slate. And because of its high elevation and its proximity to the Rocky Mountains, where you have snow-capped peaks, um, we have a lot of snow runoff, snow melt in the springtime, which then incises across this relatively easy to erode landscape, creating very bizarre and Martian-like landscapes. So most familiar in this neck of the woods are 
um, the national parks, such as Arches National Park. You've got that just outside of Moab, Utah. Um, there's a picture of Delicate Arch in the upper right-hand corner. Um, you also have at its highest point um, in terms of uh, topographical, geographical um, layering, Bryce Canyon National Park, which is there in the middle on the right-hand side. And then perhaps most famously, you have the Grand Canyon, which is also a part of the Colorado Plateau and exhibits the most extreme uh, bedrock features of this most bizarre and beautiful landscape. So there's a lot of really remarkable features throughout here. You've got Capitol Reef National Park as well, Canyonlands National Park, Monument Valley, um, really some of the most iconic landmarks in the Southwest can be found all here on the Colorado Plateau, this, this really remarkable high elevation red desert. And uh, yeah, we also have bison down here. Most people, when they think about the Colorado Plateau, when they're interested in visiting the Southwest, they think about desert fauna and flora, um, fauna such as this beautiful um, Eastern collared lizard, We've got ringtails, we have large ravens and rattlesnakes. We also have other desert creatures such as the magnificent plains and desert mammal, the pronghorn antelope, which is the fastest, the second fastest um, land animal on the planet after the cheetah. We have coyotes aplenty. Um, we also have a whole wide variety of unique sometimes endangered rodents, such as our, our uh, Utah prairie dog colonies just outside of Bryce Canyon National Park. We also have a surprising suite of carnivores on the landscape. People sometimes are surprised to learn that we have large black bear populations in many of the areas on the Colorado Plateau. Um, historically, we had grizzly bears throughout this part of the world too, and we had wolves through much of it. And now wolves have been reintroduced into the um, Arizona, New Mexico area just to the south of the Colorado Plateau. Um, but again, a whole wide variety of, of different forms of life. Mule deer are abundant on this plateau. Uh, we don't have any white-tailed deer really anywhere on the plateau. But mule deer are there in a plenty. Mountain lions or cougars are the apex predator that we have in the landscape. They can navigate the steep terrain better than just about anything else, except for perhaps the desert bighorn sheep, which are truly iconic on this marvelous landscape. And we have some other celebrated species. Um, of course, the iconic prickly pear with its beautiful flowers, which erupt in the spring and in the early summer. The recovery of our California condors across much of um, the southern portion of the Colorado Plateau, and there are streams and rivers, and they are inhabited by otters and beavers, and we also have magnificent large bull elk ranging across much of the plateau. Um, just to put things into perspective, the average elevation of the Colorado Plateau is about six to 7,000 feet, but it can go all the way up to almost 12,000 feet and all the way down to just about 3,000 feet of elevation. So again, it's a high uh, elevated desert, mostly of red sandstone rock, pretty unique landscape. But as I said before, people don't generally associate this area with bison, um, sometimes commonly referred to as buffalo. And before we start talking about bison inhabiting the Colorado Plateau. I think it's important that we introduce this species properly. Bison bison is its uh, Latin name. It is a member of the Bovidae order. So it is uh, related distantly to the cow, but it is found not only here in North America, but was also found in parts of Eurasia as well. In fact, there's still a remnant population in Europe today but this is the largest land mammal in North America. The bulls can range up to 2,000 pounds in weight. The females are a dainty 1,000 pounds. Um, so quite a, 
quite a big difference between the males and the females in terms of size. But again, the largest land mammal in North America, um, really something that is, is truly impressive to see if you've never seen one in person before. They seem large, but docile, but in fact, they can be pretty unpredictable and even very dangerous. I'm sure that many of us have heard the stories in Yellowstone National Park about people who misjudged the behavior of bison and thought that they were safe and tame, only to find out, unfortunately, later that the bison are in fact wild and were either gored or trampled by these large, magnificent animals. Um, historically, they were very abundant across North America. We had tens of millions ranging mostly across the plains of the US and Canada. Um, as many as 30 million were estimated to be ranging across North America at the time of uh, Lewis and Clark's expedition out west in the early 1800s. These animals had cousins that had since gone extinct by the time Euro-Americans made contact um, with the bison on the Great Plains. Uh, during the Pleistocene, we had bison species or subspecies that were larger than this variety that we have today, commonly referred to bison bison, the species most common as the Plains bison. There is a subspecies um, which is recognized as the wood bison, but they are kind of genetically muddied with the plains bison today and have slightly different physical features, but otherwise to the lay person would probably seem very similar to the plains bison, as was the case back in the early 1900s when we started to mix populations in an attempt to save the species. And I'll get more into that later. Um, biologically, bison will rut in August, typically, and then they give birth to their calves, sometimes endearingly referred to as red dogs, usually in May and into the 1st of June. So right about now, when these calves are dropped, they are a bright red color, which makes them, um, again, iconic for summer and springtime, wherever bison exist. But again, truly a magnificent animal, uh, capable of, of roaming across the continent in massive herds. Um, the earlier cousins that I was mentioning during the Pleistocene had since gone extinct, which gave room for this variation, this species of the buffalo, to really dominate the landscape by the time Euro-Americans began to expand westward. This is a map of the historical range of bison, kind of shows you where they historically lived. Um, as you can imagine, because they eat grass and sedges, they dominated mostly the plains areas. And in the Southwest, we don't see as many bison just because of the aridity of the landscape. And if you see the darker spots on this map, those are the places where we have uh, free ranging bison today. So greatly diminished in their range. Unfortunately, many of us are familiar with the great slaughter of the 1800s when these magnificent animals were almost completely exterminated. And I've given a, a couple talks with Natural Habitat Adventures on wildlife management in the United States, which kind of gives a history of, of this era and how we try, we've been trying to rectify it over the last century plus. Um, and if you're interested, I recommend you go and watch that. But in a nutshell, when Euro-Americans first began to colonize the West, they took advantage of capitalizing on the huge bison herds and deer herds and elk herds that were roaming free across the wilderness. Um, it was very easy to capitalize on these animals if you had a gun and some bullets. And especially with the advent of the transcontinental railroad system, um, people really post-Civil War began to, to annihilate these animals uh, for many reasons. One of the most dominant reasons was to make room for livestock. So we had tame animals, we had domestic animals such as, as cattle, um, and they are in direct competition with bison when it comes to grazing. And not only that, but 
Um, bison hides were considered valuable, their bones were utilized for fertilizer, and their tongues were considered a delicacy. So they were wantonly destroyed throughout the latter half of the 19th century. And it wasn't really until the dawn of the 20th century that we started to work to protect what was left of the bison. And this took place in Yellowstone. So I told you that we weren't gonna be talking about Yellowstone bison today, but that was, I guess, a lie because we're gonna talk about Yellowstone buffalo for just a minute. You can't talk about the species and its conservation without bringing up Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone was created as a national park in 1872. Um, it was created as a, a place to observe geological oddities, the geyser basins primarily. It was not necessarily created as a refuge for wildlife, although it eventually became as such. And in the first couple of decades that we had the national park, people could hunt in Yellowstone. And after hunting was finally banned in Yellowstone, poaching of wildlife in Yellowstone became a serious problem because as bison herds and elk herds outside of the national park were vanishing, um, there were protected animals inside Yellowstone that poachers were attracted to. And you could, for example, shoot a buffalo and sell its head for $500 um, back in the late 19th century, which is the equivalent of approximately $20,000 today. So it was very tempting to sneak into the park and remove these animals. And the National Park Service wasn't actually created until 1916. So we had a national park, but we didn't have an administration to protect its resources. And finally, because of the poaching and because of the vandalism that was taking, within, taking place within the park, um, the military was assigned to protect Yellowstone. The War Department um, sent the army out to patrol the park and to protect its, its resources. This is a picture in the bottom right-hand corner of bison herds, or excuse me, bison mounted heads that were confiscated from poachers inside Yellowstone National Park. And everywhere else, bison populations were vanishing. And it got to the point that even in Yellowstone, uh, there were only 23 bison left on the landscape. So from 30 million bison, just a couple of decades before, to less than two dozen bison, uh, we had successfully annihilated this magnificent animal to the point where we were almost sure that it would go extinct. Now, the last remaining bison herd was found here in Pelican Valley, just north of Yellowstone Lake. Um, a poacher was apprehended in this area. And thanks to the Lacey Act of 1894, bison and other wildlife were protected and the army had the ability to prosecute those who tried to poach animals or violate any hunting regulations uh, within the park. To help bison make a comeback, there were a lot of very invested people who appreciated this iconic animal and they regretted having their disappearance on the landscape. One of the most uh, well-known figures in bison conservation was Theodore Roosevelt. President Roosevelt was very interested in seeing the comeback of the bison, as well as George Bird Grinnell, among others. And while the army was uh, facilitating the park's resources during the turn of the century, they decided that they would try and augment the bison herd, which was again, just shy of two dozen animals in the Pelican Valley portion of Yellowstone by purchasing bison outside of the park and initiating a bison ranching operation, uh, which first began in Mammoth, so the the northern headquarters of Yellowstone National Park, but was later relocated to the Lamar Valley at now the historical um, Buffalo Ranch. So if you've been to Yellowstone to see wolves, you'll be familiar with um, the Buffalo Ranch, which is a good spot to kind of go out and look for wolves during the winter and the summer. Um, but yeah, the Bison Ranch or the Buffalo Ranch was where Yellowstone National Park went and purchased uh, a handful of bison from the state of Montana and from the state of Texas and brought them up into Northern Yellowstone where they were treated like livestock for several decades. Uh, these animals were corralled and were brought in every evening and penned up to protect them. 
And eventually and slowly the population in northern Yellowstone of these um, tame bison, uh, not domestic bison, but tame bison, eventually grew to the point where it surpassed a thousand. Meanwhile, the population in the interior, the indigenous population that had been whittled down to less than two dozen was steadily growing as well. And it got to the point in the 1940s and in the 1950s that the Park Service said, we're gonna let bison be bison and we're not gonna manicure them and we're not gonna manage them like livestock anymore. And they stopped corralling bison at night and the bison population, which had been introduced, um, bled into the population, which was indigenous. And today Yellowstone National Park has, depending on the time of year, three to 5,000 bison in the park, which is the largest free ranging uh, bison herd in the lower 48 states. So the bison on Yellowstone's landscape are doing very well. It's one of the most you know, iconic species that you can see when you go to Yellowstone. It's a guarantee that you'll see buffalo. I have spent my entire life in Yellowstone. Um, I grew up just outside of the park and I have never once been to Yellowstone and not seen at least several dozen bison. So they are quite common and doing very well. Well, Yellowstone National Park is situated in the lower end of the Northern Rocky Mountains, um, right there in Northwestern Wyoming, Southeastern Idaho and Southwestern Montana. I've circled it in red there. That is where we have our largest bison herd. Um, but from that location, as the bison population has grown, Yellowstone has sent buffalo elsewhere to recolonize some locations on the on the northern continent northern continental playing field. Um, bison herds have been reintroduced into some Canadian national parks. Bison have also been reintroduced into Grand Teton National Park just south of Yellowstone. And in the 1940s, clear down south, we reintroduced bison actually into southeastern, south central Utah in a location known as the Henry Mountains on the Colorado Plateau. I've circled it here so you kind of get an idea of just where we're taking bison from and where we're putting them. So out in the middle of the desert, we brought bison from Yellowstone. And I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about that story today because I think that that is, again, often overlooked and, and really is a story we're celebrating and acknowledging because it's so interesting. Utah was historically a part of the bison range, but the vast majority of bison um, did cover the eastern half of the northern or of the Rocky Mountains, the central and the northern Rocky Mountains. They are a plains animal by nature. However, bison did come out into the Great Basin and did come out into the Colorado Plateau. Um, there were just fewer of them out here, um, which is why when you read the Trapper's journals of the early 1800s and the Lewis and Clark journals, um, I'm currently reading the Lewis and Clark journals right now. And it's interesting to hear about when they encounter bison and when they don't encounter bison. It really has to do with the Rocky Mountain Cordillera, that chain of mountains, which is kind of a dividing line between uh, ideal habit, habitat for bison and less ideal habitat for bison. Um, but Utah was interested in the 1940s uh, to reintroduce this species uh, to parts of Utah, which admittedly are, are questionably preferred habitat for these large mammals. Um, nevertheless, the state of Utah expressed interest along with different hunting organizations and different conservation organizations in southeastern Utah um, to reintroduce bison back onto the landscape. And so without really any fanfare or attention, uh, in 1941, Utah collaborated with Yellowstone National Park and shipped down 18 buffalo to introduce them along the water pocket fold just to the northeast of Capitol Reef National Park out in the Robber's Roost Desert. Um, Robber's Roost getting its name from famous outlaws such as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid who made a living down in this neck of the woods. Um, but if you look at this incredible photograph, 
Um, this is just outside of Capitol Reef. You can see the monocline water pocket fold, which is a, a geologic uplifting there in the center of my photograph. And there in the upper left-hand corner of my photograph, you have the Henry Mountains, which is inevitably where the bison ended up. But in 1941, uh, we gathered a total of 15 cows, 15 female buffalo, and three bulls, three males. And we shipped them down here onto the desert and we introduced them. And there they lived. Uh, the second year, we reintroduced an additional five bison just to help out the population. But as you can imagine, the bison didn't necessarily like living out here in the desert. And after a few years, they began to migrate towards a higher elevation, cooler climate um, location, which was inevitably the Henry Mountains. The Henry Mountains, this is a picture taken from Google Earth is one of the most remarkable features all across the Southwest. And I think that it's perhaps one of the most remarkable and I'm a bit biased, but it's remarkable because it's so isolated. It's such a remote wilderness. Um, the Henry Mountains were the last mapped area in the lower 48 states. Um, it's an island in the sky wilderness surrounded by very arid desert landscapes. The mountains uh, here rise well above 11,000 feet in elevation. And because of the aridity, they don't typically have a lot of snow in the winter, um, but they can get a substantial amount of rain depending on the time of the year, um, which allows for um, green up, a phenologic cycle where the vegetation greens up, providing nutrients such as nitrogen to ungulate populations. Primarily one of the world's most famous mule deer populations resides here on the Henry Mountains. And bison that were introduced in the 1940s made their way slowly and steadily up onto these Henry Mountains. Today the Henry Mountains, again just outside of Capitol Reef National Park, about two hours to the west of Moab and Arches National Park, uh, is still a pretty untamed wilderness. There are dirt roads that we navigate when we're going up on here to do wildlife studies. Recreationists can use these roads, but they are pretty hairy. They're extremely bumpy, um, which deters a lot of public attention and public travel. But the Henry Mountains is, like I said, an island in the sky, and it provides substantial habitat for bison. And as the bison slowly and steadily over the next two decades from the 1940s into the 1960s made their way up onto this mountain range they set up shop and called this home and the population grew to the point that it reached uh, not only a, a carrying capacity a biological carrying capacity but a social carrying capacity and i'll talk about that in just a minute but we have today on the henry mountains a population of approximately 300 320 bison and that is ultimately the carrying capacity on this landscape although we have reached up to I think over 400 bison on the mountains in the past um, but there's only so much vegetation vis excuse me vegetation on this landscape to support so many mouths and uh, controversially uh, livestock producers out in this part of the country also who have been in operation a lot longer than the bison have been there um, also have to share the landscape with the bison and so the bison population is managed um, through hunting to try and manage that again at a healthy carrying capacity so the bison population doesn't outgrow the vegetation that is on that mountain range but what's really exciting about this is there are only three bison herds in the lower 48 states which are free ranging and considered genetically pure meaning that their populations have not been crossbred with cattle somewhere down the road those three populations those three herds are of course yellowstone national park as well as the wind caves population out in the dakotas and then the henry mountains bison population here in uh, southeastern Utah. So those are the only populations that we have which again are free-ranging 
and considered genetically pure. There are actually only four herds in all of North America that can claim this title. The other population being in Wood Buffalo National Park up in Northern Alberta. Today, bison populations having dwindled to just a few dozen left after tens of millions of them had been slaughtered wantonly. Um, the population has grown considerably and we have an estimated 500,000 bison on the landscape. Most of them are owned privately and are held on private land. So even though bison are no longer endangered of going extinct, their comeback is an incredible success story. Most bison do not live free ranging wild and on public lands. So again, the Yellowstone population, the Wind Cave population, the Wood Buffalo population in Northern Alberta, and the Henry Mountain population are the only herds that uh, receive those uh, kind of acknowledgements, which is again, very remarkable. Even if the population in Southeastern Utah is only hovering about around 300 animals. So, Bison restoration projects have been taking place elsewhere, but here on the Henrys, uh, bison live out a very uh, interesting life history where humans really are the only predator that they have during the hunting season, where every year about 30 to 40 uh, hunters get a once in a lifetime opportunity to hunt bison typically at the end of the year. And other than that, uh, they really don't have to worry about mountain lions. There are no bears on this isolated um, island in the sky environment. And there are also no elk living on this um, unique kind of biosphere that's, that's kept surrounded by an ocean of desert. There are just a lot of mule deer to share the landscape with. And as the bison population has grown, we've been working to try and help augment other populations elsewhere. So in 2009, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources captured and removed a number of bison from the Henry Mountains, and they relocated them to the Book Cliffs, which is just about three hours to the northeast of the Henry Mountains, uh, perhaps the most remote and rugged terrain in Utah. And there the bison population that has since been reintroduced has mixed with the Uinta and Ure Indian Reservation bison herds um, and grown to probably about 1,500 animals that now range across the book cliffs. So Utah has the book cliffs with a, a mixed herd of Indian Reservation bison that has genetically mixed with the Henry Mountain bison, um, as well as the Henry Mountain bison herd, which we've been talking about, and then Antelope Island in Salt Lake, in the Salt Lake, um, has uh, a mixed genetic herd of bison as well. Mixed meaning that at some point in time, cattle were bred into the bison population. Bison and cattle mixing was very popular in the early 1900s, where producers tried to take advantage of the best uh, physical qualities of bison and cattle and they crossbred them. And so many bison herds that you have privately owned all over the nation have a mixture of some, to some degree, cattle um, mixed in with them. And usually it's pretty low, usually it's less than 5%, but it still is, is high enough to not be considered um, pure genetic buffalo. And today as biologists, we go out there, this is a photograph I took, um, where we go out and we try and monitor the health of the bison herds. Unfortunately, Yellowstone National Park, when they were uh, augmenting their buffalo herds in the early 1900s, they transmitted brucellosis, which is a Eurasian livestock disease from the domestic cattle, which were living at the, M at the Army's headquarters, to the bison, which were being managed uh, in corrals at the time. And brucellosis is a zoonotic disease. It can be transferred to humans. Um, it makes you sick, but it generally isn't fatal. Um, but it can uh, infect uh, livestock reproduction, recruitment, it causes females to abort their, their calves, and uh, it can also uh, get into our dairy system where then it becomes, uh, again, zoonotic and can be transmitted to humans. So um, brucellosis is a big concern in Yellowstone National Park. 
Um, one of the reasons that bison are not allowed to leave the park in Yellowstone is because of the fear that that brucellosis will pass into the neighboring livestock uh, herds. And we're constantly monitoring and managing our bison populations on the Henry Mountains looking for brucellosis as well. And uh, just ensuring the overall quality and health of our, our animals. The population, like I said, has been about 300 for several decades now. And we've been talking, I'm not, you know, working with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources anymore, but the conversation when I left was we're working to try and uh, get some more buffalo coming from Yellowstone, most likely, and augment our herd uh, by bringing in new, fresher genetics to keep the, the viability of the population healthy and well. Currently, there's no concern about genetic bottlenecking, but it's likely to happen in the future if we don't begin to augment that population with some fresh blood. And I will wrap up by saying that the bison recovery story across North America truly is, as many of us are aware, something that is uh, worth celebrating. Uh, bison are the United, it, the bison is the United States uh, mammal of, um, iconic mammal, it's the national mammal for the United States. And for good reason, this animal is uh, not only sacred to many indigenous peoples, but also is appreciated worldwide for its its unique adaptability on the landscape, its charisma, and just how important it is to our, our ecosystems. And I think, again, what a cool story that the Colorado Plateau, unbeknownst to many people, has this genetically pure, free-ranging population living out in the middle of the desert kind of away from the fanfare. It, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of determination to get to the Henry Mountains to look for buffalo. And so you have this population which is living truly in, in a wilderness state. And I think that that is remarkable. And since uh, the Obama administration uh, passed the bison as a national mammal, um, Back in 2009, we've been working very hard to try and identify locations across the Great Plains where we can have further bison reintroductions to create more uh, robust, genetically pure, free-ranging bison herds. And these include areas of the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in Montana and the um, American Great Prairie Reserve, the American Prairie Reserve, which is in central Montana, um, an area of about 3 million acres where we hope to restore bison in the near future. So what a cool opportunity to share this story with you all. And thank you for having me today. Aaron, thank you so much. You always bring us such interesting topics. Um, before we start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone that they can submit questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, so let's go back to the earlier part of your presentation. Um, one of our uh, viewers asks, I've heard white-tailed deer are invading the West and out-competing the local mule deer. Can you speak to this? Yeah, I can. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but it is true that mule deer populations throughout the West are shrinking and white-tailed deer, white deer populations are filling the niche that is left behind by the mule deer. Um, some of this might have to do with uh, interspecific competition between the two species. Mule deer and white-tailed deer have a lot of biological variation and differences between the two animals. Um, you generally don't have any crossbreeding between the two species. The mule deer is, is typically a, a hardier mountain deer, if I can generalize it that way. Uh, the the white-tailed deer have the capability of living on the plains and also in urban areas, perhaps in, in higher concentration. But I think that there's, there's a lot of variability and reasons at play here, but it, it's true that our mule deer populations are not doing well. And contrastingly, hmm. our white deer, our white tailed deer populations are doing very well. Hmm. Um, where are the Eurasian bison found? In the Caucasus. So I don't know, I think there's probably, man, this is off the top of my head, I'm, I'm rusty here. I think that there's probably 200 animals are left in the Caucasus. Okay. So 
um, they used to, you know, be all through there. And uh, yeah, that's another cool story too that I encourage people to look up. Mm -hmm. um, are elks and moose larger than buffalo? Can you give us a size comparison? Yeah, so elk and moose are deer. They are cervids. Um, bison are a bovid. Um, bison males weigh about 2,000 pounds on average, and bull elk generally weigh about 700 to 900 pounds, and a moose can weigh about 1,000 pounds to 1,200 pounds. The largest moose that we have in Alaska, which are the largest moose in the world, they're about 1,500 to 1,700 pounds. Um, so still hundreds of pounds less than the male buffalo. Hmm. Um, curious if you've heard any updates on the condor deaths caused by the avian flu that is causing so many problems, including escalated egg prices. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to say other than avian flu is, as many of us are aware, has been on the landscape for a year and a half now, I believe, and um, affects uh, mostly waterfowl and, and raptors, but can affect all, um, all birds. It really affects domestic birds, such as chickens and turkeys. Um, and it doesn't surprise me to hear that it's uh, impacted condors as well, but I don't have anything else to say about that, that I know of. Okay. Um, are wood bison still found in Canada and the United States? So wood bison, bison athabasque, if I remember right, versus plains bison, 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 um, bison, 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 athabasque. Those are the, those are the silly scientific names for these animals. It is a subspecies <laughs> which has some slight physical variation from the plains bison. As I said before, if you don't know what you're looking at, you would mistake the two. They look that similar. It's not like one looks very dissimilar. The hump shape is a little bit different as well as the head shape, but it's so subtle that um, in the early 1900s, when we were trying to save a lot of our bison herds, we unknowingly, without DNA, we mixed uh, plains bison with wood bison. Um, we did this in several locations. It was debated for a long time about Yellowstone National Park and its indigenous herd perhaps being wood buffalo, and we had screwed up by putting plains buffalo in Yellowstone. Um, now, I think a lot of the research is saying, no, it was probably plains bison that we had in Yellowstone originally. But in Wood Buffalo National Park, those were wood bison, and we put a lot of plains bison up there. So the populations have kind of bled into one another. They can crossbreed, and so the, the genetics are now muddied. I think there are probably a handful of areas with very few bison which can be identified truly as, as wood buffalo. Um, but again, in most cases, we've, you know, un unwittingly, uh, in an attempt to save the population, we, we mix the two. Got it. Okay. Um, do you know the story of how bison got on Catalina Island? Oh, I've heard this story before, and I don't, but I can deflect the question by giving you a different story. Okay. <laughs> um, I know that. I know that there are bison out there and um, bison have shown up in very strange places because bison ranching was a great interest in the early 1900s and now it is taking off again as, a, as an interest. My, my brother goes into bison ranching and it's really a good, more environmentally friendly practice than uh, you know, harvesting Herefords or, or Angus cattle on the landscape. Um, but I was, waiting for someone to ask about the bison on the Kaibab Plateau, which is in the northern portion of the Grand Canyon. So just off of the north rim of the Grand Canyon, there's a buffalo herd, which was introduced by a man named C.J. Buffalo Jones back in 1910 or something like that. Uh, this gentleman 
was an ambitious entrepreneur who was involved in getting the bison population up and running in Yellowstone National Park. He brought his expertise down to Arizona, where Arizona said they wanted to have buffalo. And the bison population down there on the Kaibab Plateau on the north rim of the Grand Canyon is doing very well, but it's very controversial because there's no historical or archaeological evidence that bison ever were present on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So some people, including the Park Service, doesn't like having bison down there. And other people don't mind having bison down there. So, and that's technically a part of the Colorado Plateau. Well, you led right into my next question and alluded to the controversy, um, but do you know if there's any ecological concerns about having them there? On the Grand Canyon? Yeah. Um, yes, there is. There's always a concern when you introduce a non-native species. Um, even if it's very, like the implications of the ecological effects are subtle, um, we're still very cautious. For example, areas where mountain goats have been introduced, uh, where we used to have bighorn sheep, bighorn sheep and mountain goats share a dietary overlap of like 91.4%. Um, so they eat the same things, but they behave differently on the landscape. And so there's kind of a push and pull about well, we ignorantly introduced an animal on the landscape. Is it negatively impacting the environment? Yes or no. Park service ev everywhere, and this is a good thing, the park service has a pretty hard uh, stance, a pretty hard protocol about only protecting and preserving historically native wildlife. And so whether or not it's negatively impacting the environment, I think the park service doesn't like having bison there because there's no evidence that they ever were there regardless of their impact okay um how are climate change and drought affecting the herds of the hen of henry mountain bison drought is a significant concern out there um i mean drought is it's scary everywhere um Bison are extremely tenacious and very hardy, and the population, as I mentioned before, is managed closely by the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources to keep the population around 300. And um, drought affects overall recruitment of calves, so how many can survive into adulthood the following year after they're born. Um, right now, uh, the population is, you know, I think it's just below 300 and that's kind of normal. It fluctuates, you know, in and around 300 based off of the year. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Hmm. What about herds that have been transported from Yellowstone to several indigenous people's reservations? Are they also genetically pure bison and free range? Yes. So this is a conversation for another presentation that I'll have to do sometime because Yellowstone's buffalo issues are extremely controversial and it's not Yellowstone National Park that's making it controversial. Um, as I mentioned, Yellowstone, Yellowstone buffalo have brucellosis confirmed in their herds, which is a, is a disease um, that can be um, can infect people and it can infect livestock just outside of the park. Because of this concern, um, several governments, the state governments, local governments, and the USDA uh, manage and monitor bison very closely as they try and migrate out of Yellowstone. And every year, bison have to be culled from Yellowstone National Park so the population doesn't continue to grow beyond the carrying capacity of, of the park. Um, so we corral a bunch of animals leaving Yellowstone National Park and we test them for brucellosis. The ones that are tested for brucellosis end up getting um, shipped to slaughter and the meat is donated to indigenous tribes um, all across the West. Um, bison that are held in quarantine that do not test positive for brucellosis um, are monitored closely over a long period of time. You have to quarantine the animals for months, sometimes even over a year. And if they test uh, clean, so they don't have um, brucellosis, 
then we are working really hard to get these sent to several indigenous communities, mostly in Montana, such as the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, um, where the tribes are working hard to try and reintroduce bison on the landscape. But it's not like a, you know, you don't just take blood from an animal and it's positive or not positive. And if it's not positive, you slap it on the rump and send it off somewhere else to live. It's a very expensive process and it takes months, sometimes even years before animals are declared clean enough uh, to be relocated. So it's, it's a long, difficult and expensive process. Mm. And they are, they're, you know, the same bison that are coming off of the parks. Um, yeah, off of Yellowstone National Park. So they have the same genetic uh, pedigree. So they're considered uh, genetically pure. Mm. Um, in Oklahoma, there's a population of about 2,000 bison at the Nature, Nature Conservancy's Tallgrass Prairie. Um, did you not mention this group because of genetic contamination from domestic cattle, or because they are on private land, or because the herd is managed with vaccinations and confined somewhat? Can you talk a little bit about that herd? Yeah, for all of those reasons. So they're not considered free-ranging because they're not on public lands, so they have to be monitored and managed on private lands. Um, they also don't have the same genetic classification of being pure. Um, but after saying all that, I'll acknowledge that, man, a buffalo is a buffalo, and it's it's pretty cool to have those animal animals on the landscape. And just because you have a little bit of cow in your buffalo doesn't necessarily affect the behavior of the animal. It just definitely doesn't affect the aesthetic of the animal. So. Um, that's a truly remarkable conservation story right there, and I'm sure I could learn a lot from it. Mm. Um, can you clear up the um, bison versus buffalo? Is there yeah. a time and yeah. place to use one or the other? Yeah, so bison is the technical term. Um, these animals are not technically buffalo, just like an a pronghorn is not an antelope. It's not related. Bison and buffalo are not closely related, although they are related. They're not closely related. You have like water buffalo, for example. Um, that is a true buffalo. Bison is the official and technical name for this animal, but it is commonly referred to as buffalo, and it probably is coming from the French term when French uh, trappers and explorers were in North America, buffalo, or um, buffalo referring to the beef or the beef of the meat. It's, I mean, it, we're humans, right? We all have local names for animals. Very often we call these animals buffalo. And I think that as long as you recognize that in a scientific paper, you ought to be writing bison instead of buffalo. Um, it's just the, it's just the local colloquialisms of whatever area you're living in. So I say buffalo quite a lot, and I acknowledge that technically this animal is a bison, not a buffalo. Hmm. Um, can you touch on um, bison ranching? What does that yeah. mean? How do people make a living who are ranching or you know raising bison? Yeah, so there's an American association of bison ranchers. I believe that's what they're calling themselves. Um, but bison is a really popular produce right now um, for multiple reasons. One, because it's lean. Um, people really like lean, clean meat, more organic, if you will. Um, so as far as consumption goes, there's kind of a push to move away from cattle, at least in some of your like um, local independent uh, farmers market kind of locations and uh, people just really like bison. I love bison. Um, I've never hunted a buffalo, but I do have family and friends who go out and they hunt they hunt bison and so I get a substantial amount of buffalo meat. Um, it tastes great and it's very lean, as I said. But in terms of the operation, people really enjoy switching from cattle to bison because bison, are require less babysitting. They evolved on the North American landscape. So they're, uh, despite being large, they're easier on the landscape. They create less environmental disruption. Um, 
they're more tenacious. You have less to fear when it comes to losing livestock to predators such as wolves or grizzly bears in the area. Um, they generally take care of themselves. So there's kind of like a growing cult of, of bison producers that are really enjoying how easy it is and how profitable it can be to raise bison. And because it's kind of a novelty, um, generally bison meat sells for almost three times the market value of cattle. So that's also you know, a profitable thing. Um, the reason why people had such a hard time with ranching bison in the early 1900s is because they were ranching them like they are cows and that's not gonna work. And we just were ignorant of how to better manage uh, tame bison. Um, you have, it's a completely different kind of, of ranching. Uh, but yeah, I think it's exciting. I would love to see every cattle, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, but I'd love to see every cattle operation in the West operating buffalo instead of cattle. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I agree, I like, I like um, the bison meat too. Um, that's the last question we have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for some closing comments. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and thanks for the question and answering session. That's my favorite part. I appreciate you all listening in. I hope that you have an opportunity to explore the Southwest. If you're ever truly adventurous, then maybe you can go up to the Henry Mountains or the Book Cliffs and you can find some of these magnificent animals. Um, yeah, thank you all again for tuning in. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you again, Aaron, for taking the time to present for us today. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. Please join us again next week for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everybody.